the edge of evolution strikes again. I'm going to go over several points on this. Um, uh, first, I'm going to give you a little bit of the background. I'm going to give you the proposal that uh, was made in the edge of evolution. The protests against this proposal and uh, Behe's response at the time. Um, the latest information, which is an article you'll see, and uh, then my take on it. For what it's worth, the references will be as we go through. Anybody who wants them, uh, uh, those of you who got the email, they'll be in that. And uh, those of you who didn't can look at it online and uh, freeze frame it and take it down. And then, of course, um, my opinion and then your opinion. The background, uh, Michael Behe was a PhD in biochemistry and perhaps as important a tenured professor, which means that Lehigh University couldn't fire him from, for whatever he did. Um, he did a lot of work on hemoglobin and malaria. That was one of his, perhaps his major uh, interest, um, which is a you know worthwhile thing since malaria is in fact uh, the, I think the number one killer in the world right now, uh, even surpassing such things as tobacco. And um, uh, he noticed while he was doing his work in biochemistry in general, he kept bumping up the, against the idea of irreducible complexity, where a standard Darwinian model would say each little step helps. Well, what do you do when it doesn't work at all until it's 99.99% finished? The last few little steps could be influenced by evolution, but the ones in front of them really couldn't be. And um, once he did that, he wrote Darwin's Black Box and um, was very thankful that he was a tenured professor. Um, he got a lot of criticism from those who felt irreducible complexity didn't exist in biology. Um, and as he kept thinking about this, he realized that there was another way to approach the subject of the adequacy of evolution to produce everything we know. And uh, that is to notice that evolution can't do any, everything. I am, maybe it can do a lot of things, but just to put it very crudely, <coughs> if you have a petri dish full of salmonella or some other bacterium in the laboratory, and you leave that petri dish alone and walk out and come back the next morning and you find a cockroach in the di dish, it is not the first hypothesis that you would entertain that the salmonella have evolved into a cockroach overnight. That is to say, there is some speed at which evolution doesn't work. In fact, if you leave the petri dish in there for three years and come back and find a cockroach in it, I think you're safe in saying that, that it didn't evolve into a cockroach in three years. So somewhere there is a line beyond which we do not go with standard evolution. Well, precisely where is that line? There has to be a limit to what evolution can accomplish, even if it's a kind of fuzzy one and sometimes it makes it and sometimes it doesn't, but there should be some, some way of drawing that line so that you can make uh, you know, perhaps evolution can't do this for practical purposes. This is a gray zone and then with varying degrees of, and then once you get over to here, evolution can easily do that. So the question is, can we define that edge and where is it? And out of that was born the book, The Edge of Evolution. Now, Michael Behe was working with malaria parasites, and malaria parasites mutate all the time, and there are selective pressures. And so it seemed to be an ideal case to study. Perhaps the only more ideal case would be the one of E. coli, which has been studied extensively as well. Um, as um, 
as he put it in the um, on page 14, um, one difficulty of writing a book questioning the sufficiency of Darwin's theory is that some people mistakenly conclude you're rejecting it in toto. It is time to get beyond either or or thinking. Pardon me, either or thinking. Random mutation is a completely adequate explanation for some features of life, but not for others. This book looks for the line between the random and the non-random that defines the edge of evolution. To back up a couple of pages, until a century ago, humanity was ignorant of the cause of malarial fever, so no conscious defense was possible. The only way to lessen the intense, unyielding selective pressure from the parasite was through the power of random mutation. Hundreds of different mutations that confer a measure of resistance to malaria cropped up in the human genome and spread throughout our population by natural selection. These mutations has been have been touted by Darwinists as among the best, clearest examples of the abilities of Darwinian evolution. And so they are. But as we'll see, now that the molecular changes underlying malarial resistance have been laid bare, they tell a much different tale than Darwinists expected, a tale that highlights the incoherent flailing involved in a blind search. Malaria offers some of the best examples of Darwinian evolution, but that evolution points to both to what it can and, more important, what it cannot do. Similarly, changes in the human genome in response to malaria also point to the radical limits on the efficacy of random mutation. Now, in the book, he goes on to outline um, the human mutations, all of which degrade systems that are nice to have for humans, but from the point of view of malaria parasite, are even nicer to have, such things as sickle cell disease, uh, band 3 disease, um, absence of Duffy antigen, um, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, the various, um, um, and I'm trying to think of what, um, uh, thalassemias, uh, all of which make people less efficient but don't allow them to get malaria or at least make their malarial cases very mild and uh, allow them to fight the malarial parasite to at least to draw, if not win. The proposal in An Edge of Evolution, though, has more to do with malaria fighting what humans have been doing in the last 50 years. Mal uh, it points out that malaria has not been able to adjust in all the time that sickle cell trait has been around, which is a long time, uh, has not been able to adjust to the sickle cell trait defense of some humans. Malaria also has not been able to adjust to survive in lower temperatures. Uh, you know, if it could, it could attack Eskimos, but it doesn't. Um, malaria can adjust to modern medicines. And it's interesting how it does it. It adjusts to uh, atovaquone. Um, and in fact, chloris, uh, chloroquine is the best medicine to deal with malaria. And we're going to see why very shortly. And the question that he asked was, how many mutations does it take for malaria to adjust to atovaquone and to chloroquine? Well, as it turns out, Atovaquone resistance is found in the lab in one in every trillion organisms, more or less. Um, it requires one mutation, position 268 in a particular protein, which he didn't mention and didn't reference, so I can't tell you exactly which protein it is. But it takes one mutation to make uh, Plasmodium falciparum resistant to uh, atovaquone. The best estimate for chloroquine resistance was one in 10 to the 20th organisms, which, by the way, was a published estimate by uh, somebody by the name of Nicholas White. Um, and there's a reference. And Behe estimated that two mutations are required for chloroquine resistance, two more or less simultaneous. Now, they didn't have to both happen in the exact same 
organism. It's possible that one happened in uh, an organism whose uh, great great grand uh, son organism um, had another mutation or something like that. But the idea is that one mutation's not enough. It requires two to really do any good. Okay. Now, um, uh, I'll just quote some of the stuff that, that tells you how he came to that conclusion. Scientists have analyzed the protein from Plasmodium falciparum from patients in South America, Asia, and Africa. The mutant PFCRTs exchange, uh, pardon me, exhibit a range of changes affecting as few as four amino acids to as many as eight. However, the same two amino acid changes are almost always present. One switch at position number 76 and another at position 220. Notice almost always, not quite. <coughs> The other mutations in the protein differ from each other with one group of mutations common to chloroquine resistant parasites from South America and a second clustering of mutations appearing in malaria from Asia and Africa. Later work suggested that there had actually been four separate origins. Let us compare the two numbers for the odds of achieving resistance to atovaquone where just one mutation is needed versus chloroquine where presumably, since if a single mutation could help, Clarkwin resistance would originate much more frequently, two are needed. Again, he's presuming this. He doesn't know that for sure. He's guessing. Um, let's dub mutation clusters of that degree of the complexity, one in 10 to the 20th, Clarkwin complexity clusters, or CCCs. On average, for humans to achieve a mutation like this by chance, we would need to wait 100 million times 10 million years. What that means is that if you've got your mutations lined up, you can get them pretty rapidly. Although not as fast for humans, because we don't have one trillion humans around right now. We only have about seven billion, and, and uh, if we go back further than that, um, uh, the estimated population during the time when humans were evolving into humans, supposedly, is um, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, one in a hundred thousand or so. Um, so the the numbers don't add up very fast. Um, well, there are a lot of people who reacted to this and said, ah. You blew it. Arthur Hunt, for example, at the Panda's Thumb, uh, published an article, uh, the most relevant paragraph of which I'm quoting. Chloroquine resistance in P. salfiparum uh, may be multigenic and is initially conferred by mutations in a gene encoding a transporter, PC, PFCRT. In the presence of PFCRT mutations, mutations in a second transporter, PFMDR1, modulate the level of resistance in vitro, but the role of uh, PFMDR1 mutations in determining the therapeutic response following chloroquine treatment remains unclear. At least one other as yet unidentified gene is thought to be involved. Resistance to chloroquine in P. falciparum has arisen spontaneously less than 10 times in the past 50 years. Okay, so that part he agrees. This suggests that a per, per parasite probability of developing resistance de novo is in the order of 1 to 20 parasitic multiplications. Now what that is, is that is a direct quote from the Nicholas White paper. So you can see Behe he is, uh, you know, coming to the order of 10 to the 20 is accepting a fairly standard estimate. Um, by the way, Notice here that um, this suggests um, uh, there. There's he's saying that there's actually a number of different mutations that are in involved. 
Recall that Behe equated one CCC with double mutation, presumably based on other work showing that the two-point mutations in the PRCRT gene are associated with durable resistance in the parasite. Well, actually, he based it on uh, looking at the 10 to the 12 count compared with 10 to the 20 and Nicholas's estimate of 10 to the 20. And this is something that these people miss if you were reading carefully. But White is not talking about double mutations in PFCRT when he tosses out the number 10 to the 20. Rather, he is speculating about the frequency of occur occurrence of a multigenic trait. No, he's not speculating. He's estimating from clinical data about the frequency of occurrence of a multigenic trait that involves two or th uh, three genes and more, perhaps many more than two mutations. In other words, Behe's use of this citation to argue that the natural frequency of occurrence of a double mutation in PFCRT is, uh, is 10 to the 20th is inappropriate. This is one reason, not the only reason, but one, why Behe's claims are so out of touch with reality. So, now if you're looking behind this, there's actually good psychological reason for Arthur Hunt to be arguing this way. It is that if a CCC is actually only two mutations, then that means that for human evolution, every single mutation has to be beneficial, bar none, because otherwise we couldn't get from the uh, human chimp ancestor to humans, at least without divine intervention. And so Arthur Hunt, when he says, oh, this is multiple mutations and it's 10 to the 20th, is giving evolutionists a lot of leeway. As you see, evolutionary re uh, reasoning will come a, the exact opposite, but all of them agree Behe is wrong. So here's PVM, and uh, I don't know who PVM is, but he publishes this at the American Scientific Affiliation, which is a theistic evolutionary group. Um, uh, there are a few problems here, although I appreciate your enthusiasm. We need to remember that in the case of malaria, there appear to be a minimum of two and perhaps five to eight mutations necessary. So you see, there's a whole bunch of mutations. This simply cannot be extrapolated to other examples, like humans. And then to skip down to the other money paragraph, all B. he has done is argued that a double chloroquine resistance-like mutation would be improbable one in 10 to the 40, and he calls this the edge of evolution. Not very insightful as it does not address how likely observed mutations are. In fact, a double chloroquine mutation may be required, uh, may be required for, that would be Behe's estimate, to 20. That's why he's saying there may be lots of mutations that are required to get chloroquine to uh, fight um, uh, to get malaria to fight chloroquine. May require four to twenty simultaneous mutations. Not a very plausible scenario, anyway. So, well, there's Jerry Coyne, uh, who's recorded a talk reason, uh, although I don't think that's his blog, and I think that this is actually a secondary source, but. Uh, uh, it's a sympathetic secondary source, so I think that uh, we can probably rely on it. Uh, Behe's probability calculations, on which his entire argument rests, are flatly wrong because they assume that ad adaptation cannot occur one mutation at a time. They need that one mutation at a time pathway that gradually builds up. He uses chloroquine resistance of malaria as an example saying that the parasite must always, always must have two mutations arising together to evolve resistance. Okay. As Ken Miller shows, this assumption is false because one of the two mutations that Behe claims are required for CQR is not actually required. Well, he claimed that it might be. 
And um, the, he gives a reference, which uh, interestingly, it's not the full reference, but um, presumably at uh, the original blog, it would have been there. Uh, it is therefore bogus to take the 110 to the 20 number as the estimate of the probability of evolution of a single binding site for CQR. So he's got the wrong mutation identified. Therefore, he's wrong about two mutations. Therefore, you can't draw any of those conclusions. Kenneth Miller, Falling Over the Edge, and this is published in Nature, and uh, you can get that, uh, although it's behind a paywall for those of you who don't actually get Nature and can't find a library to help you out. Behe obtains his probabilities by considering each mutation as an independent event, ruling out any role for cumulative selection, and requiring evolution to achieve an exact predetermined result. Not only are the, each of these conditions unrealistic, but they do not apply even in the case of his chosen example. First, he overlooks the existence of chloroquine-resistant strains of malaria lacking one of the mutations he claims to be essential at position 220. This matters because it shows that there are several mutational routes to effective drug resistance. Second, and more importantly, Behe waves away evidence suggesting that chloroquine resistance may be the result of se sequential, not simultaneous mutations, boosted by the so-called ARMD, accelerated resistant to multiple drugs phenotype, which is itself drug-induced. In other words, the mutation rate goes up so that you get good mutations or beneficial in this, in this setting mutations. By the way, for what it's worth, these mutations are not beneficial to the organism itself. And the reason for that, we can say that with some confidence, is that if you take chloroquine-resistant malaria and chloroquine-sensitive malaria and you don't treat for years, what will happen is the chloroquine-sensitive malaria will outcompete the chloroquine-resistant malaria. In other words, the resistance comes at a cost. It is not uh, creating superbugs. It's just simply creating bugs that we can't control with our medicines. Um, now, this is interesting because now he's arguing that really it wasn't simultaneous mutations that that 10 to the 20th happens to be along a sequential pathway. Now, if you think about that, what that says is that some sequential pathways are even difficult. So they're actually, in this case, shooting themselves in the foot. But they're doing it for an evolutionary reason. That is to say, there must be a stepwise pattern because Darwin said there was, I guess, or because it will be needed. But if the stepwise pattern is like 10 to the minus 20 in probability, then uh, you've got an even more difficult problem because then when you come to a double mutation required, you're way out of your league. Likewise, David Levin, um, whom I don't know but uh, writes at the NCSE blog, National Center for Science Education, that's uh, Eugenie Scott's old stomping grounds, um, uh, writes, Behe's thesis of evolutionary limits hangs on the assumption that important evolutionary steps require multiple simultaneous mutations without benefit of cumulative selection. However, there is no evidence to support this claim. Now remember, Behe is saying the scientific evidence that we have says that it's a probability of, of arising is 10 to the minus 20. That's a datum. That's not a conclusion that I'm making from my calculations. That's what the public health data says. Okay? Uh, yes, just a minute. Did Behe insist that it be simultaneous? Well, well, I read you what he said, which isn't really very much. I, uh, and I think that if you were to push him, we'll, we'll come back to how Behe reacts to this. So um, 
Um, but the, the point is that if it's sequential, it makes it even worse because what it says is that there are some pathways that take huge numbers of organisms, which you can do with malaria because malaria, there are you know, probably a trillion organisms in any human body that's infected. But if you try to do that to humans, there haven't been a trillion humans in the history of the world. I mean, you can do the math as to you know, how many generations, how, how, uh, how many years, uh, and you run out of people. That's the problem. Well, you know, maybe there's one trillion, but it's not, you know, it's not like you can just, 10 to the 20th is, you know, way off the scale. Um, his error is evident even in his example of chloroquine resistance, which by his logic should not have involved evolutionary intermediates, but the scientific data say otherwise. Notice how confident this guy is that he is wrong. The existence of natural isolates of, of malarial strains that possess one or the other of the supposedly critical mutations suggests not only that evolution of chloroquine resistant is a stepwise process, as has been argued by others, but that there are multiple mutational paths to resistance. I want, you to point, I want to point out to you that if there are multiple paths to resistance, and it still is 10 to the minus 20 as a probability, of arising, then what you're saying is evolution is really, really, really difficult. P. Z. Myers, and I think this finishes it, um, Frangilla. He invents a new metric, the CCC or chloroquine complexity cluster. This is the probability of evolving a fairly simple trait in a malarial parasite, resistance to a compound called chloroquine. Malaria that is resistant to chloroquine has two specific changes uh, to a protein pump called PFCRT. One amino acid at position 76 and another position 220 are changed from the f more common form. By a couple of arguments from the probability of getting two independent changes in the sequence and the observed frequency of evolution of chloroquine resistance in a population of infected people, he comes up with a number. The odds of acquiring this specific pair of mutations is 1 in 10 to the 20. Now notice he didn't actually do that. He got that from Nicholas White. Fair enough, if you demand a very specific pair of amino acid changes in specific places in specific proteins. I agree, the odds are going to be very long on theoretical conclusions alone, and the empirical evidence supports the claim of improbability for this speci that specific combination. Uh, but he goes on to say, of course, that's not true. This is really sequential. Behe's reply. And unfortunately, it used to be on an Amazon blog. And um, for some reason, that blog has turned invisible to Google. And uh, uh, all of the links to it that I have found have turned dead. So I am stuck with quoting him from a secondary source. But again, it's a friendly secondary source. So I think that we can reasonably trust that um, it covers the point. The number I cite, one paragraph in every 10 to the 20 for de novo chloroquine resistance is not a probability calculation. Rather, it is a statistic, a result, a data point. Furthermore, it is not my number, but that of the eminent malariologist Nicholas White. I do not assume that adaptation cannot occur one mutation at a time. I assume nothing at all. I am simply looking at the results. The malaria parasite was free to do whatever it could in nature to evolve resistance or to outcompete its fellow parasites by whatever evolutionary pathway was available in the wild. Neither I nor anyone else were manipulating the results. What, what we see when we look at chloroquine resistant malaria is pristine data. It is the best that random mutation plus selection was able to accomplish in the wild in 10 to the 20th tries. Actually about 10 to the 21st tries and that's why it's arisen about 10 times. Behe's response, um, and I'm going to point out that he also notes that, um, that for him it's uh, not, well, I'll just read it. Miller asserts that I have ruled out cumulative selection and required plasmodium falciparum to achieve a predetermined result. I'm flattered that he thinks I have such powers. However, the malaria parasite does not take orders from me or anyone else. 
I had no ability to rule out or require anything. The parasite was free in the wild to come up with any solution that might help it by any mutational pathway that was available. I simply reported the results of what the parasite achieved. Certainly, there may be several routes, maybe permutations of pathways too. But whether or not there are several routes, the bottom line is that resistance arises only once for 10 to the 20th parasites. So Behe is guessing that there are two mutations that are required before significant resistance arises. He doesn't know for sure what they are, although he makes a proposal that 76 is one and 260 whatever it was is the other one. Okay, uh, just, you know, that's, that's um, uh, you know, an educated guess. But in any case, Whatever it is, and that's why he calls it chlor uh, chloroquine, um, whatever it is, uh, CCC, cluster. complexity cluster. That whatever it is, whether it's one mutation followed by five others, or whether it's two mutations at the same time, or whether it is uh, five mutations that have to occur at the same time, that whatever it is, it doesn't happen more often than once in every 10 to the 20th organisms. Well, time has marched on. And now, in April of this year, we have an article. Oh, uh, boy. Uh, that should be Summers instead of Summers A. I, I don't know how I missed that. but. Um, this is uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Now, there is an abstract available for this. Um, I thought that PNAS was online, but uh, at least. It'll be available in six months. Oh, okay. So they have a six month block on it. Oh, four months. Yeah, four months. Four so months. so that, that answers the question. Um, it, you can't get it right now, uh, although you can get it from the library, or um, Warren Johns kindly found one uh, copy for me. Um, but uh, the abstract is available. And here's the abstract itself. And I'm just going to go over the first and last part because the middle is uh, not as directly relevant. Mutations in the chloroquine resistance transporter, uh, PFCRT, which we've seen that uh, number or acronym before, are the primary determinants of chloroquine resistance in the malaria parasite, Plasmodium falciparum. A number of distinct PFCRC uh, haplotypes containing between four and ten mutations have given rise to CQ resistance in different parts of the world. Here we present a detailed molecular analysis of the number of mutations and the order of addition. And there is an order of addition. You can't just uh, mutate one and then the other one in any random order. Um, required to confer CQ transport activity upon the PFCRT as well as the kinetic characterization of diverse forms of PFCRT. We measured the ability of more than 100 variants of PFCRT, so they've really done their homework, um, to transport CQ when expressed on um, uh, frog uh, oocytes. In order to get them away from the, the, the animal itself, they wanted to separate them and test them individually. Um, and uh, to skip to the, the lower part here, a minimum of two mutations survive for low CQ transport activity and as few as four conferred full activity. The findings that diverse PFCRT variants are all limited in their capacity to transport CQ suggest that resistance could be overcome by reoptimizing the CQ dosage. Now, you're going to find out this is a huge public health thing as well, um, uh, which is why it's worth paying attention to this besides the question of Michael Behe. And I'm going to quote um, a couple of uh, paragraphs in various places in the, in the article. Hence, a relatively modest increase in the CQ concentration could lead to lethal levels of the drug accumulating within the DV of CQR parasites, CQ-resistant parasites, chloroquine-resistant, of course. Um, what that means is that these things can't stand up to chloroquine forever. 
that if we can get the chloroquine level high enough, it'll kill the resistant ones as well. And in fact, they give some public health data that suggests that's the case, that what's part of what's happened is we've been dosing chloroquine too low for these organisms. And you just, you know, uh, double the dose or, or, or extend the, uh, uh, the release, either one, that you can, in fact, pre prevent Plasmodium falciparum from living in your bloodstream. So this is actually a public health thing as well, a medicine thing for those of you who are physicians. Just uh, pay attention to how much chloroquine you're giving. We are dosing too low. I mean, we're dosing fine for the sensitive ones, but not for the resistant ones. You d double the dose, the resistant ones fold too. Uh, we found that two main lineages of mutational routes lead to chloroquine transport via the chloroquine-resistant transporter, and that a low level of chloroquine transport is conferred by as few as two mutations. Notice not one. Be he was right, it requires two. However, the attainment of full transport activity is a rigid process that requires mutations to be added in a specific order to avoid decreases in chloroquine transport. That, well, yeah, you can uh, uh, have it, uh, um, have, it uh, have the mutations happen in any order, but if you have them happen in certain orders, they won't, what you'll have is chloroquine resistant organisms suddenly become sensitive and then become resistant again which means that if you're giving gradually increasing amounts of chloroquine that you need to be resistant to, uh, you don't have that advantage that will allow you to be selected out. In fact, you'll have a disadvantage. You'll be caught on a temporary hill. Mm. Now, this is uh, some technical stuff, and I'm going to make it a little bit easier for you by noting that um, some of the abbreviations for amino acids are given here. Um, we've reportedly previously, we've reported previously that reversal of the K76T, the number 76 should ring a bell here, um, that is going from K lysine to, three, uh, to T threonine. Mutation abolishes CQ transport via PFRCT um, of a particular variety. Um, reference 15 and PCRT variant D3 in figure 2A. And here, the same, so these people have been working on this for a long time. This paper is not just, uh, you know, come out in the last year. They've actually been already working on part of it, and now they're working on another part. And here, the same change abrogated the CQ transport activity of PFCRT from Ecuador, a variety of 1110, um, PFCRT variant E1 in figure 2B. Reversal of either the N75E mutation in PFRCRT D2 or the N326D, which is going from asparagine to aspartic acid, which is not a, not a huge change, but it's apparently enough to do the job in either PFCRT Ecuador or PFCRT PH, which I would have to dig through to find out exactly what that is, also substantially reduced the protein's ability to transport CQ by 80%, 98%, and 92% respectively. Now, you see, if you're only transporting 2%, for practical purposes, you might as well not be transporting any. And that's why you have to have, you know, you have to have two mutations before it gets anywhere near reasonable. Reversal of the other mutations affected CQ transport activity to a lesser extent. In other words, you might go down to, you know, 40% or 50%, but that's still pretty good. It's enough to make the uh, organism perhaps resistant to somebody who's taking their medicine every other day instead of every day or something like that. These observations indicated that case 
76T, uh, N75E, which goes to uh, glutamic acid. I, no, that's Q. I'm sorry. N75 um, asparagine to glut, uh, glut, gl glutamic acid. It is. Um, uh, in that uh, PCRFT uh, DD2 and N36 to D, which is asparagine to aspartic acid um, in, in the Ecuador and the PH1, play pivotal roles in enabling PFCRT to mediate CQ transport. Nevertheless, introduction of K76T or N75E into a, a kind of a standard malaria um, did not result in significant uptake of CQ. So if you make one mutation, it doesn't matter. If you make the other mutation, it doesn't matter. You do both mutations and suddenly they have decent uh, chloroquine uh, transporting ability. And then if you add three or four more, they have really good chloroquine transporting ability. However, the addition of both mutations produced modest but significant CQ transporting activity. And there's, you know, it went up from 19%. Uh, none of the other DD2 mutations imparted CQ transporting activity when combined with K76T. So they combined, they did all the variations that you can do, and you have to have those two. If you don't have those two, it doesn't matter. But once you have those two, then you can improve it using several other uh, mutations. So that is the nature of the chloroquine complexity cluster. Likewise, the introduction of K76T and N30, N326D into the standard stuff was significant to confer a low level of CQ transport activity, about 45% of the, you know, the really good transporter. Whereas neither of the other two East, uh, Ecuador ones um, mutations imparted CQ transport activity when combined with K76T, uh, D33 uh, and E7. So the minimum requirement for low CQ transport activity was N75, that's the one that Behe mentioned, one of the two, and either 76 or 326. And those are the specific mutations. So what actually happens is you can have one mutation you can have your choice of either the mutation of the one right next to it or one a ways down the line. And now you have chloroquine resistance, and then after that you can kind of dress it up. PZ Myers reaction is kind of interesting. Here's the, what his critics actually said. Now keep in mind, you've heard the critics, including PZ Myers. We have no problem with the idea that a particular functional phenotype requires a couple of mutations. I can think of lots of examples of that, such as the work of Joe Thornton on corticosteroid receptors. That the malaria parasite needs two mutations was never a point of contention. Um, nor was it particularly worrisome. What was wrong with Behe's work is that he naively claimed that the two mutations had to occur simultaneously in the same individual organism. Well, I read Behe's stuff. Uh, did he actually claim that? Um, so that the probability that could happen was product of multiplying the two individual probabilities. That's ridiculous. Well, is that exactly what Behe said? That they had to be in the same organism? Well, you notice two main lineages of mutational routes lead to chloroquine transport. However, the attainment of full transport activity is a rigid process that requires the mutation to be added in a specific order. And so it requires two, as few as two mutations, but no fewer. So it requires two mutations that occur in the same organism. They don't have to necessarily be the same 
uh, de novo in the same organism. One could be inherited and the other one could not. The one thing I'll point out is there's a reason why the wild type is the wild type. It's because it works better. So that what's really happening is that if you have the mutation one, then it's detrimental to the organism to a slight degree and that one tends to fade out. So there's selection against it. That's why the wild type is the wild type. And then uh, if it's selected out before the second mutation can hit, then uh, chloroquine resistance won't be a factor in which organism lives. Now, my own take, I think that Behe made a reasonable assumption given the data he had, and except for the fact that he had the wrong mutation, has been vindicated. As in fact, um, there's actually two pathways, and it still is a 10 to the minus uh, 20 probability that an organism will get those uh, the effective mutations. His detractors, I think, were too busy opposing him to judge the data fairly, and you notice that they were on both sides of the argument, or even to hear his arguments correctly, and I think they still are. I think P.Z. Myers uh, illustrated that. <laughs> They are not willing to give Behe any points whatsoever. If there are other structures that require two otherwise neutral or deleterious mutations that are analogous to the CCC to maintain, obtain an increase in function, they're out of the reach of large mammals. That is to say, humans can't evolve that way, elephants can't evolve that way, whales can't evolve that way because it takes too long to make the cycle. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Uh, for what it's worth, if you're wondering what that little creature is up there, that's supposed to be a scanning electron microscope with a little extra color that uh, has uh, a couple of them have uh, malaria parasites, one of which is pretty much empty of them. I don't have much to, uh, to add to this, uh, except that I want to emphasize what you just did at the, you closed off that it is so improper for us to try and relate rates of mutation in malaria parasites to mammalian reproduction because one is so much more rapid than the other. I don't know how many malaria parasites you have in the world, but. Uh, uh, and they're reproducing very rapidly. Well, they figure that since the 1950s, when chloroquine became available, yeah. uh, they're figuring that uh, it's 10 to the 21st power, which is a billion, 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 <coughs> billion. When you come to, <laughs> and these reproduce you know, extremely rapidly, <laughs> uh, when you come to uh, vertebrates, that lay eggs every year, or uh, humans that wait, you know, 10 years at least before they have offspring. And, uh, the comparison uh, is not valid, or we should say uh, it forces you into a whole different mode of rates of mutation in terms of how you're going to advance uh, from, I say, a mouse to, a, to an elephant. Uh, it just does not work at all there, even though it works here in malaria parasites. We have a question way in the back. A comment. I guess it takes someone who is not um, active in the science field, but is very interested to have the courage to ask the stupid question. <laughs> um, so for the benefit of any other layman that may be in this audience, 
Um, are you saying, Dr. Roth, that um, because of the what you said can't happen when comparing malaria bacteria and human reproduction or elephant reproduction, um, that if it takes so so terribly long for the malaria to mutate, think how much longer it would take mutate to make the evolutionary result. Think how much longer it would take for the human to have to mutate. Because of the slower reproduction. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. Okay. You have to speak simply for me. <laughs> and louder, please. <laughs> No, we're we're glad that uh, you you caught the main point uh, that and that uh, that was one of the things that uh, Michael Behe pointed out too, is that you have ten to the twenty first organisms of malaria since nineteen fifty. Uh, we haven't had near that many humans. Um, I've seen estimates of ten to the twelve or ten to the thirteen or something like that. Um, uh, by Durrett and Schmidt, for example, who will go on to tell you that the probabilities of getting a two mutations, both of which are neutral, and remember, in this case, they're probably not actually technically neutral, otherwise they would be fairly well represented in the population, um, uh, that there's probably a very slight disadvantage, and that's why the wild type is what it is. Uh, but in in the case of uh, in the case of humans, uh, the probabilities by Durrett and Schmidt's estimate <coughs> are less than one in a hundred, which means that out of a hundred that you need, you're likely to get one, maybe zero, maybe two, maybe three. You know, there's a statistical probability curve, but to expect to get all 100 is just nuts. <coughs> what that means is that evolution has to proceed in a very, very straightforward way. Each and every mutation has to be advantageous. There can, there can be no hills where you can sit at the top of the hill and if you just go down a little bit, you can go to the next hill. Or maybe there's one hill that you're allowed by sheer luck, but after that, you're, after that you're asking too much. You're asking to win the lottery twice, basically. It's not going to happen. One winning of the lottery, maybe you get, you know, but you know, two, two, two winnings, they start looking funny at you. If you win it three times, I want to know where your nephew is. You know. <laughs> and how many mutations would it take to change a human to a chimpanzee? I mean, a chimpanzee to a human. Uh. Well, let's take that famous 1% and multiply it by the... Uh, uh, how, many, how many important changes are there? Let's put it that way. Uh, the probabilities of getting that kind of uh, a mutational uh, just you know just have to be astronomically low, uh, and if each one of them isn't advantageous, you can't get there. Even if each one is advantageous, it isn't enough time for the selection to sort it out. How, how's it going to spread through the population? You got that problem. And of course, that's not even counting genetic drift, which is always pulling you back. Yeah. Genetic entropy. To me, uh, one of the deeper uh, questions that this raises is uh, how do we avoid the acrimony that we see here in this? And this is something we need to guard against. I, I think there are two things that we can do. And when I'm in that kind of a setting, I try to practice both of them. 
the first thing is be scrupulously careful not to contribute to the acrimony, even if that means you're going to get hit unfairly and you, don't, you, you can't strike back. But the second one is to point out that when people are using ad hominem arguments, and you don't, you don't have to point it out viciously, but just say, you know, you're not, you're arguing against me, maybe I don't know mm -hmm. what I'm doing. Um, but here are the facts I see, what do you do with the facts? And saying that, I think what it does is it refocuses on the actual numbers, the actual data that we have. Um, and people, uh, the, the person who's arguing against you, you may or not, may not ever win them across, depending on how badly they need. And most of the people who are most vociferous are the people who need it the most. <coughs> so they're not going to change their minds. But there are a lot of people out there who are watching and listening and realize, you know, who's making the wild accusations, who's um, yelling and stomping, and who's calmly pointing out the facts and saying, and, and not telling the other person they're an idiot. As soon as I see acrimony, I, I just tend to turn the whole thing off, at least. Uh, uh, but uh, it seems to work because I keep seeing it out there. It, well, you know, there's somebody else who had a lot more acrimony thrown at him than, than either you or I or both of us together have had. And he managed to go through with it anyway. And if he's our model, then I think we have a duty to uh, walk into the lion's den if that's where God wants us and still make it. I'd like to raise the uh, ultimate philosophical question, that's creation versus evolution. It seems like what uh, Behe is presenting is n not an argument for theistic evolution by my definition. My definition is that theistic evolution, God is behind the scene, but he's not actively working. He's at a distance. He sets up the rules and the logic. And then he lets it run. And lets it run. Kind of deistic evolution, if you want. Yeah, it's about the same thing. Um, what B is presenting is that there has to be some kind of interventionism, some kind of creationist activity, where he differs with a sh young age creationist as he says, well, God can take his time. Young age creationists say, well, the Bible says he didn't take his time. So they would differ there, but in either case, you have divine intervention. Am I assessing this correct in light of uh, mutation rates? Uh, I think you are. And I think that, I mean, one of the things that people don't realize is that common descent is not really the issue. Because B, he accepts common descent, and he still gets p pasted. Yeah. And people still are just angry with him. And in fact, if you want to see a in very interesting divide, it's to have B, he and Kenneth Miller, both of whom are Catholics. So it's not a religious divide. Both of whom believe that God is a God who can't intervene. But in, and, and in fact, Miller concedes the possibility that God could intervene in the quantum interstices without destroying the standard, uh, um, uh, without destroying the, st the, uh, the standard model. But where they differ is precisely that B, he thinks that if you look at it, it's pretty easily discoverable that, in fact, something has intervened. And, and he will say, he can't prove God did it. No. All he can say is some, something that apparently wanted humans, but at least that ha wanted something that, that could guide things into that direction, intervened. Whereas... Uh, and that, if you look at it, you can actually tell. 
Uh, so uh, and and uh, Miller will say, well, God may have intervened. I don't know, but if you look at it, you can't tell. So if you want to know the precise dividing line, it's there. Can you tell that God intervened? That has some very interesting implications given what uh, Romans 1 uh, has to say about God's uh, divinity being recognizable. But it also has a very interesting implication. What the real controversy is has nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with uh, and short age, because if it was, be he wouldn't be persecuted. It has what it has to do with is, is science safe for atheists? That's the project that we must make an atheistic, friendly explanation of the world. It doesn't have to be atheist. If you want a God who set it up, that's fine. You know, people who speculate that maybe God started the Big Bang, eh, you know, well, I think it's a multiverse, but you know, whatever. Because you can't prove that. But when science starts going against atheism, them's fighting words. Um, I was curious, um, you only uh, showed P.Z. Meyer's final reply or something. Was that before or after the... Uh, that was after the paper. After the... the, the, the mm, pre proceedings paper. Yes. So was he not aware of the pa what the paper said? These people have to win the argument. They cannot admit, you know, B, he had a point. So the, the you other notice question... That, you notice know, so what he does, well, you know, no, we never really disputed this. We never really disputed that. What the real problem is, is here, and B, he expects them to have to be in the same individual. And I'm sure that if you were to ask B, he, um, he would say, no, they don't have to be in the same individual. They just have to be and close so enough to where they happen together. That's yeah, yeah. And, and nobody's arguing that they had to happen at the same moment. <laughs> well, but, but, uh, but that's, that's Meyer's interpretation of Behe's. Why does Meyer do that? Because I think he knows that Behe is on the wrong side and therefore he has to be wrong and, and therefore you don't have to be as careful. Uh, the question I, 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 the other question is there were several other, um, how should I say, opposers of what Behe wrote. Did any of them reply to be his response? Well, if you notice the clock, I finished at, I think, about 25 after. Uh, we got started probably t five, 10 minutes late. If, if I had given you a complete survey, we'd <laughs> still no, no, be no, going no, I on. Was just so I, I was if, just, if, because it was, I thought it was interesting, I ran across this and I pulled it out rather right. than trying to research the entire thing and give you okay, everything there so was. Um, I if, I, if I'm writing a paper, of course, I, I can I afford to do that. I appreciated the obvious um, observation that the um, proceedings paper stayed out of this fray altogether and just stayed with the facts. Uh, that was interesting. They didn't say Behe was wrong when he estimated. Or right or anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and maybe that's the way data papers should be. Yes. You know, that's right. let somebody else draw the conclusions. Yes, those who want to fight, let, let them fight their own battles. We'll do our work. I think it's fascinating work yeah. because what it says is that all we've got to do is just turn up the juice a little bit and they'll all die. What? Well, yeah, the side effects may be limiting, but I, I have a feeling of what they did to start out with was to give a whole bunch of people, you know, varying doses and maybe double the, the, the minimal dose, figuring that it wasn't too bad. James? 
Um, uh, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, you have to be careful because hydroxychloroquine, of course, is used for entirely different results. Uh, so if you did too much chloroquine, you could get in trouble. But on the other hand, if you're dealing with a resistant mode of uh, plasmodium falciparum, those are nasty actors. They kill people. And you might want to just say, well, you know, if my mouth tastes metallic, I'll, I'll live with that for a while. You know, it, uh, uh, humans can make those conscious choices that say, if it's a trade-off, I'll take the trade-off. Yeah. You know, it's a little bit like saying, well, don't cut on me. Well, you've got appendicitis. Well, <laughs> you know, it's better to have you cut on me than it is for me to let that sit and rot and do whatever it's going to do. And, and so, uh, but, but it's really encouraging to think that a little bit more and you'll cure it. Well, uh, I guess with that we will um, close for today. I, isn't Bill Gates um, funding some malaria treatment uh, option type project? I, I think he was. I, I don't really know for sure. Uh, you know, I, Bill Gates' account. I'd love to know how that's progressing. Um, anyway, next week, uh, for those of you who are uh, uh, still here, why we'll uh, we'll go over quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics for dummies. Uh, <laughs>